Thank you guys so much for turning out on this hot and humid May 22nd, 2024. Um, most exciting part is that ORC is here. So those who aren't here or those of you who want to review what was said, you'll be able to. I'll send out a link for that soon. Um, there's just a couple housekeeping things. There is a bathroom at the back of the room. Um, and the windows do not open in here, sorry to tell you. Um, the, there was a sign-up sheet at the back of the room, which before you leave, please sign up. It's thanks to Vermont Humanities that we're able to do this program and the Berlin Historical Society also. Um, we kind of share the, the costs of it all. And I told a couple of you that it's quite unusual that I would serve something like soda at an event. However, <laughs> however, um, special circumstances. This is the location of where the A&W used to be. And that's why there is a board all about the history of oh. A&W because awesome. that's, where, that's where we are. <laughs> it's, really, it's, it's really quite an interesting thing. There's even a photo of a, the, the twins um, who first built it. They, um, they were juniors in high school and they were looking to earn some money to go to college. And the two of them went to Norwich, and then they had three younger brothers, and all of them went to college. There was a dairy bar next to here, too. It's a great story. So shouldn't you be on roller skates? <laughs> <laughs> that's what somebody else said. Don't you want me on my feet? <laughs> but anyway, so that's, that's why there's A&W root beer, but there's lots of other juicy stuff over there, too. Um, the Historical Society would love to have more members, especially ones who would be interested in doing some projects. Um, especially since the pandemic, but just because the way life is, there haven't been a lot of active members. And uh, there's truly lots to do, but it's whatever you wish to do as far as there's some scanning of records that would be great to have it on a computer and backed up. Um, there's looking into stuff. It doesn't have to be at the office. Uh, at home, sometimes I think I'm going to go to bed at 10 or 10.30 and I end up being up till midnight or so because that's when I have time to look up stuff. Um, anyway, if you haven't seen our space, it's up at the Berlin Town offices on Shed Road. I'm happy to make an appointment with you. Evenings and weekends are fine. Once in a while during the day works. I mean, I do get a lunch time, so you know, if there's something where it has to be during the day, we can make that work. A couple of upcoming events. There's boards at the back about them. Um, the Montpelier Historical Society is having, what are they calling it? Montpelier Neighborhoods, East State Street, half a mile of history. They're having on Sunday, June 9th from 2 to 2.30. There's more information about it back there. To, thank you. I'm one, of the, the, yeah. oh, I'm one of the speakers <laughs> for that. But um, we realized that it could sound like it's a street walk. It's oh. not. It's a slideshow. Yeah, it's, it's a program. At the Nature Center. It's a program. So, okay. And then I don't have a date for it yet, but Laz Skangas is going to do a Central Vermont uh, Railroad History <gasps> for us, which will Ooh. include information on both the Montpelier Junction Station in Berlin and on the Montpelier Station. So I need to get that scheduled, but that will be upcoming. Um, at the end of this, I am hoping that we can shift gears a little bit. There's a little video that I want to show you. Boats, of course. Um, something that, uh, um, what is her name? I'm blanking on it, hold on. It's Lynn something and I can't see in the dark. Lynn Monty. It's something that she filmed and she said that I could use. It has Russ Steves and Joyce Chambers in it. It only lasts like two minutes. I think you'll enjoy seeing it, but Let's get right on with why we're really here, and that is because Douglas Brooks agreed to come, and he is not only a boat builder, writer, and researcher, um, he specializes in construction of traditional wooden boats for museums and private clients. Mm -hmm. He has studied with boat builders from Japan and is working with the Henry Sheldon Museum, and uh, basically researching and surveying historic boats and boat building on the Lake Champlain Basin. 
Um, he's authored several books, and I hope he will take a couple minutes just to kind of fill you in on the details about himself before he dives in to the project <laughs> that he has here, the program, because it's really interesting. <laughs> and I, I've watched one of his programs. I always do that before I invite oh. someone. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. Yeah, thank you, Bryn, and the Berlin Historical Society, as well as the Vermont Humanities Council and uh, their Speakers Bureau series. And if you're not familiar with that, go to the council's website, and there's essentially a catalog of speakers. And any Vermont nonprofit can bring uh, a speaker to their organization, and the Humanities Council will reimburse the expenses for that. So keep that in mind. Um, it's a pretty diverse catalog of of people. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about my uh, focus on my research, which um, is part of a project with the Henry Sheldon Museum that that I've called in Champlain's Wake, the small boat traditions of Lake Champlain. Uh, the large commercial vessels and the military vessels of Lake Champlain have been pretty thoroughly documented, but the small boat traditions have really been left out of um, research and museum collections. And so I tried to fill that gap. Uh, as Corinne mentioned, um, I have a background in museum boat building. I got my start, I actually built my first boat at Mystic Seaport in Connecticut and eventually um, became the uh, museum boat builder at the Maritime Museum in San Francisco and that was prior to my first trip to Japan. Uh, in Japan I've done a great deal of work. Uh, I've apprenticed with nine boat builders over the years and uh, published five books on traditional Japanese boat building. So, but here at home, I live in Virgenz. Um, I, uh, I not only find historic boats, I have historic boats find me. In other words, people know a little bit about my reputation and contact me and show me boats, and you'll see examples of that. So, again, been working with the Henry Sheldon Museum of Vermont History in Middlebury. They've been the fiscal sponsor and partner uh, for this local research. And one of the words I'm going to use a lot is documentation uh, in the course of this talk. This is a lines drawing. So this is what I would call a thorough documentation of a historic boat. This is actually a drawing by Henry Rushton, who is a builder active in Canton, New York. Um, and what you see in the upper half of the drawing, you see what we call a construction plan. You know, showing the pieces, how the pieces go together, and the bottom half of the drawing we call a lines drawing, which defines the shape of the boat. And uh, from this drawing, which is actually a, is from a reprint of uh, Rushton's 1903 catalog, um, I built this boat, mm. which is a replica of the Rushton cat boat. So um, that's a quick primer on, uh, on boats. And as far as looking at the small boat traditions of the Lake Champlain Basin, um, I, I take a very, very broad view of those, quote, traditions. And um, I like to show this photo. It always gets a laugh, these photos. But that young man on the left, as an elderly man, gave me these photos. And that is he and his brother in 1950, and on the right, that's his mother. And they were kind of your classic 1950s kids reading magazines that encouraged, sadly, mostly just boys, to build what we would consider lethal toys. <laughs> but that is on the Lemon Fair River in Shoreham, Vermont. And they grew up on a dairy farm. And they would play on the Lemon Fair, and uh, they put these boats together following this magazine's instructions. The one thing he couldn't remember is what kind of barrels those were. And I've always asked audiences, does anyone recognize that size and shape of wooden barrel? They whiskey barrel. Yeah, well, they're, they're smaller than a classic whiskey barrel. I've had people say nail kegs. I've had people say apple barrels. Probably in the Shoreham area, 
apples is probably the best Carol. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, but to me, this is every bit as valuable in terms of looking at a maritime culture as anything else. Um, because it's about people's relationship with the water. And this is a this is is really and is also a great cultural snapshot of its era. So um, but I'm going to talk about two really the, the title of my uh, talk is from skiffs to sail ferries. And here we have this is a pretty um, widely reproduced lithograph and this is at chimney uh, at Crown Point. It's actually the view is from Chimney Point looking across to Crown Point. That's Port Henry, New York in the background. And there's a lot going on here. There are the small boats in the foreground. That is a sail ferry. And then in the background is a steam ferry. That's the GR Sherman, which was the steam ferry that ran between Chimney Point, Crown Point, and Port Henry until it was put out of business the day they dedicated the bridge in 1929. That was the last day that ferry ran. So I'm going to focus on boats as small as apple barrels up to the size of the sail ferry. And that constitutes kind of the smaller boats of Lake Champlain of, of that region. Um, sail ferries were incredibly important. This is the lower part of the lake. Um, you see West Bridport and Crown Point. And this is a map from the 1890s. And you see one, two, three, four ferry crossings. Those are all sail ferries. And I like to point out that of all the methods of, of propelling a ferry on Lake Champlain, horse, the horse ferries, sail, steam, diesel electric, sail ferries have the longest history from at least 1790 through the 1920s. So, um, and the lower part of the lake is where most sail ferries operated because the conditions, the physical conditions were perfect. The lake was quite narrow, it ran north-south, and prevailing winds were either from the north or from the south, and I'll talk a bit more about that in terms of the sail ferry's design. Um, sail ferries survived even as technology came along to kind of make sail power obsolete. This is at Larrabee's Point. This is the location of the current cable ferry that runs from Shoreham to Ticonderoga. This is a sail ferry, we can tell, because of the lee boards that are still on the hull. They've cut the rig off. And what's a mystery about this boat is how did, how did it get back, go back and forth? And if you look closely, there is, there is some kind of mechanical device right here. And I, I've had a lot of theories about this. There could be a small push boat obscured uh, by the passengers on the other side, that's a possibility. But I uh, have wondered if, given that today's ferry runs on a cable, it's merely guided by the cable. Perhaps that started with a ferry that somehow cranked itself on a cable back and forth across the lake at that spot. Right. But this is the classic sail ferry and a little bit about these boats. Uh, the mast is stepped to one side and that's to keep the boom clear from the deck. And so the sail ferry does not turn around. The sail ferry is symmetrical fore and aft and you sail across you know, you pull that sail around, catch the wind. The wind is either going right up the lake or right down the lake. It takes you across. You let your passengers off the other end. You move your steering oar to the other end of the boat, pull the sail around, and off you go back the other way. You have not turned around, okay? And uh, the sail ferry shares that kind of sailing configuration with many of the boats of Polynesia that also do not turn themselves. They just reverse course. Um, 
Later, uh, this is back to Larrabee's Point. There's a great evolution of boats at this spot. And we have, could be a sail ferry hull, could be purpose built. There's a smokestack. There's now these two houses on either side, but it maintains the sail ferry ramp off either end. Um, and uh, I, I would say this boat also doesn't turn around. It probably just reverses and comes back the other way. Uh, this is a great photograph because not only are there two cars on the shore there, there's an automobile on that sail ferry. Okay? So those, those two cars are presumably waiting <laughs> to be taken across the lake. You can go to this spot today. If you come down to Crown Point and you go to the foot of Ferry Road or main, the Main Street, essentially in Crown Point, you will see the remains of this ramp. The road goes straight into the lake. And if we were to go back to um, the map I showed, or a modern detailed map of the lower Lake Champlain, you will see many, many roads that run perpendicular straight into the lake. And where you see one of those roads on the New York side, I guarantee you, you will see a road on the corresponding on the Vermont side. And that, that's a sure giveaway of a sail ferry crossing, an original crossing. Uh, this is a great shot of a sail ferry, another automobile coming off the boat. The sail is well patched. Um, and they, ha they also happen to have a, some kind of work skiff. Maybe they're pulling that along as they go. Um, the other thing about the configuration of the sail ferry is by stepping the mast on one rail, you can, you can just make out these wires called shrouds, which obviously hold that mast up from blowing over this way. But you've got no place to run shrouds to keep that mast from falling down the other way, right? On a normal sailing ship where you put the mast in the center of the boat, you can have that rigging to either rail. So the sail ferries always have this, what I call a hard shroud, a solid wood shroud that holds up the mast. Uh, this this shot, um, I got, this is an amazing, to me this is an amazing shot. This is the only photo I have ever seen that shows a sail ferry and a steam ferry together. And that's a chimney point, okay? And that's the GR Sherman. And was obviously running at the same time, just like the lithograph, running at the same time as also a sail ferry. So they were presumably in competition. Um, uh, but this is a great photo uh, in giving this, I've been giving this slideshow now for almost 20 years. Um, several of the photos you'll see, and this is one of them, have come from the audience. Uh, so after a talk that I gave over in Port Henry, somebody came forward with, with this picture. So uh, you have to hand over your historic <laughs> photographs. We will we'll frisk you before you leave. Um, again, if you go to Chimney Point State Historic Site, the brand new bridge is there. Drive down past the building, the inn there at Chimney Point, down to the launch ramp. And when you're at the launch ramp, you're under the shadow of the new bridge. Off to your left, you'll see all this kind of cobblestone. It's all overgrown. And that is this stone pier, the remains of this stone pier. The corresponding pier at Crown Point was destroyed in the construction of the latest bridge. That was quite, a, there were pilings there. That's all that remained. And they were only visible when the lake was unusually low. But it was sad, it was sad for me to see as that bridge was being built that that, that was destroyed. But the remains of that is still visible on the Vermont side. What's the year of that photo? Uh, this photo, well, so the Sherman goes out of business in 29, so it's definitely before 29. And the sail ferry, the sail ferries by 29 are gone. So um, the Sherman operated for a long time. Um, really, any, I, I'd say we could say maybe 1890 to 1920. A quick guess off the top of my head. Um, the reason sail ferries are close to my heart is I built one. Um, and so a lot of this research came from 
after getting the contract with the, for, with the state of New York to build a replica sail ferry, I had to, I had to design it. And I worked with an experienced uh, naval architecture firm that's designed a lot of replica wooden ships in America. And uh, mostly the design came from uh, historic photographs. So that's why I have a good collection of sail ferry photos, uh, probably the most comprehensive collection. And, um, uh, and I, should, I should acknowledge that the two major sources uh, in addition to private citizens were the Vermont Historical Society and the Benson Historical Society. That little Benson, Vermont had, because there was a sail ferry that operated there quite late, and they had a great trove of historic photos. But I built this boat in, we launched in the year 2001, um, and this is somewhat of a hybrid vessel in that uh, the contract called for this to be Coast Guard certified to carry passengers. So there was a huge safety factor. Uh, the Coast Guard inspected the construction once a month for 18 months and then did static stability testing and all kinds of things once we we're in the water. So there's a flush deck here, whereas the original sail ferries were just sort of an open box. And we, because we had to have watertight compartments. But otherwise, I feel like it's a, it's a pretty, pretty good replica. And there we are out sailing, that's Port Henry in the background, and it was really great fun to both play with how do you negotiate with these twin lee boards, and then the tacking routine of, of backing up instead of turning around. Another famous sail ferry, um, and, and from looking at the photographs, this is um, probably the biggest sail ferry that operated on the lake. Um, this is in Arnold Bay, and if you're familiar with Arnold Bay and Panton, I mean, you know this spot. This is, it looks exactly like this today. Um, but the uh, man named Loyal Spaulding was one of the longtime operators. But this ferry's claim to fame was that it carried John Brown's body across the lake. So in the middle of a snowstorm, John Brown's body arrived by train in Virgins, was taken by sleigh to Panton. And there was a big, uh, you know, there was a whole group of people, including John Brown's widow, was with it. And the story is that John Brown's widow, on a December night in a snowstorm, implored the ferry owner to take every, the body and everybody across the lake and she was able to convince them. So amazing to imagine setting sail in the dark, <laughs> in a snowstorm, uh, and uh, yeah, to bring John Brown home. Uh, this is the same boat on the other side. This is the Arnold Bay, this is uh, Barber's Point, which is about a mile south of Westport, New York. And the reason the sail ferry landed here a mile south is to try to sail from Arnold Bay to Westport is an upwind sail, slightly. And the sail ferries, I, I don't, they weren't capable of it. That'd be my opinion. That would be a very tricky thing to do. Having sailed one, I can say that you can make slight upwind progress, but only slight. <laughs> you really only sail with the wind coming over the beam, a beam reach, where the wind is coming right across the boat. So anyway, Barber's Point, and conveniently, there was a big tavern here. Um, but this is a tremendous photograph, a couple of things. So it's got a date, 1892. Uh, this is a very brave captain. That hard spar is broken, <laughs> okay? So the wind is coming from the far side of the boat Everything's okay, he's got his wire shrouds. But boy, if the wind were to change direction on him, that, that would have been disaster. But the other thing that intrigued me about this photograph is this amazing collection of identical rowboats. This one here is the only odd one, has a transom. But all these beautiful, Beautiful double-ended row. There's nearly a dozen. And we're going to get a close-up. 
ignore the little boy peeing. <laughs> um, but take a look at those boats. They are beautiful. And I, and then you can get a closer look at all the boats in the background. You see, they're all identical. And I got this photograph from Irwin Barber, who passed away a few years ago. He's in his late 80s. And his family has owned this property for generations. And he told me these are called Hayes Skiffs. And they were built by a man named Dennis Hayes in Westport, New York. And if you're familiar with the Adirondack Guidebook, they're very, very similar, but they're bigger. Yeah. And if you know the guideboat, and I'm going to show some guideboat photos, it would be lethal to take a guideboat out on Lake Champlain because they don't have the freeboard. They are not an open water boat. They are a small pond boat. And Dennis Hayes was obviously influenced by the guideboat, but he built a seaworthy guideboat. And what Erwin Barber told me that was interesting, he said that his uncle told him that if you were to go down to the tavern from downtown Westport, you didn't saddle up a horse or get in a carriage. You rode your boat. That everybody in Westport got around by boat. And one of the most important places for people in Westport to go was Panton, Vermont because apparently Panton, Vermont had a blacksmith shop. And there were some other businesses or needs that were in Panton that weren't accessible to people in Westport. So Westporters were constantly rowing across the lake to Panton. And Irwin remembered his uncle saying that it is 600 strokes of the oar to get to Panton. <laughs> so really interesting kind of subculture. Of, and, and I'm in the midst of trying to do more work on these boats. I finally found an original. It took me years, but this is at a private club in the Adirondacks. And um, it has a lot of similarities to guideboat construction. But again, it's a much bigger boat, truly a seaworthy uh, boat. This is the boathouse. In, uh, it's called the Ausable Club. It's a very private, very exclusive club. I was only allowed in in the middle of winter. Uh, I was told I was, would not be allowed in when any clients were present. Um, but those, most of those guideboats, that's the club boathouse. And that's a guideboat on the right. And you see how narrow it is. You kind of see how low it is. Um, uh, uh, most of those guideboats are over 125 years old. And they're just owned by the club, and the club owners use them on a daily basis. It's really extraordinary. Uh, so this is, I'll, so I'll, I'll digress here. This is a classic Adirondack guidebook. So, you know, when you look at the Lake Champlain Basin, I mean, this is, a, this is one of America's most iconic small craft. Um, and, you know, what, this is a well-known photograph. There's our guide, who in many cases would have been the builder of the boat. So in the off season, in the winter, what guides typically did was build these boats. Uh, that was true in the St. Lawrence as well, that kind of culture. And this is your happy client, which I love the name. In the, 18, in the late 1800s, they were referred to as sports. So he's the sport and they've had success got a deer. But you see the, the low freeboard, very little distance off the water. Again, this is not something you take out on Lake Champlain. Can I uh, ask? Yes, please. Yeah, and feel free if you have a question. I've got a couple of these, my wife and I, uh, from, you know, Ferrisburg, Vermont. Oh. Uh, and so I have two part question. Part one, I'm told that this is, the design is really about having that, the ability to have that weight in the center so that you can do exactly what is depicted here. Right. Uh, and the second question that I'd ask is, how far have those boat builders strayed from this earlier tradition, this earliest tradition? How, what boat builders? The, the, fair, the guys in uh, Ferrisburg, the, oh, uh, the, the modern, Vermont the guy. Conventional builders. Yeah. Oh, okay, my ironic guy. So the question was about the design. And yeah, the, the guide boat hull is one that actually becomes more stable the more weight you put in it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's perfect for what you see here. Yeah. You know, I mean, they have 
for a small boat with low freeboard, they, they actually, and how incredibly light they are, yeah. and how finely built they are, uh, they really have a pretty tremendous carrying capacity. And as far as the company in North Ferrisburg, Adirondack Guide Boat, what they, they make, they make a very, um, uh, in terms of the shape of the hull, a very authentic replica. They make their hulls out of Kevlar and fiberglass trimmed with wood. So that's, um, and then they make, they make some updated designs of the guide boat. They have one they call the pack boat. Yeah. But, but their guide boat is, is really very reminiscent of the classic so, form. If we receive what you showed us right at the beginning, a line drawing of the yeah. early ones, and yeah. compare it to a line drawing of the ones they're making, they'd be pretty similar. They'd be very similar, yeah. And Adirondack Guide Boat also makes a wooden version, yeah. but it's strip planked, little narrow strips, and it's got a layer of fiberglass on it. But it, they're beautiful boats. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really interesting company. I, I'm friends with the brothers that own it. And, and I really, really like those guys. So we got one down out of, just outside of New York City last summer. They've been sitting outside for like three years. It yeah. was really in rough shape. And those guys, uh, the two brothers, were incredibly helpful in nice. terms of guiding us on the refurbishment. Of that, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. yeah, they're really great, great people. Yeah, and those boats are just a dream to row. They sure are. They are amazing. So yeah, and the best, the very best collection uh, is at the Adirondack Museum, which is now called Adirondack Experience in Blue Mountain Lake, New York. Uh, they have about 250 guide boats in their collection. Most of them are in storage. I was actually over there a few weeks ago. Um, uh, watching some documentation work they were doing on the boats in their collection, but um, well worth well worth a visit if you're in the Adirondacks. Uh, another example of a boat. This is a boat that found me. Um, I kind of followed up on some leads and tracked this boat down, and the owner um, the owner said he was about to burn it. Yeah, well. And um, I I did. Well, depending on whether or not you're married to me, I did the smart thing of a stupid day, <laughs> and I bought it. Um, but this is a great boat. This is obviously home-built, and we're gonna talk more about traditions of owner-built boats in, in Vermont and Lake Champlain and New York. This was built in New York State, and uh, it's phenomenally heavy. It's got a great little galvanized shiv here, which was probably for dropping an anchor to go fishing. Um, absolutely in phenomenal condition um, and that's the sail uh, an old gasoline banner I don't know if anybody remembers Tidal gasoline anti-knock gasoline but that was the sail and then this letter is dated 1930 1930 and talks about paying $25 to do restoration work on the boat. So in 1930, the boat was already old. Um, but it's, again, another example of people's relationship to the lake. Um, as a boat builder, I could say that there were some things to be desired from whoever <laughs> built this. It's really built like a tank. But it's uh, just a great example of a historic boat. And um, I've managed to find it a caring home. Um, I'm gonna switch gears now. This is Lake Dunmore in Salisbury, Vermont. And this is a historic photo of the Waterhouse livery. And I, you know, there's a lot of comparisons between uh, information Corinne sent me about liveries that were created on Mirror Lake, Berlin Pond. Um, the Waterhouse family for three generations ran a livery out of this building. And this is the fleet. And the fleet consists of, there's a lovely double-ended boat there and at the dock. Then there's this lovely transom sterned boat, these folks in it. And then these very simple flat bottom, flat sided boats. Uh, there's another one back there. Um, and Will Waterhouse, who founded this, oh, and there's a modern photo, same building. Yeah. 
and that's the public launch ramp. So you're, that's, I took that photo trying to get the same view. Um, and this, I believe, after years of sleuthing, is one of these boats. So Will Waterhouse built some of the boats for the livery. And the Henry Sheldon Museum has a set of boat molds, patterns, that you bend your planks around. And I believe the patterns are for the, this style of boat. And then I would have no doubt that Will Waterhouse could crank out those boats just to get a volume of boats, build a simple boat. Um, I finally tracked down this boat and I am trying to get to measure it, it's privately owned, and it's owned by a descendant of the Waterhouse family who said they took it from the livery. It passed down through the family when the livery, the livery, the third generation finally sold the property in 1965. Um, and I, I'm convinced it's gonna match those boat molds. So that's a ongoing, that's an upcoming project. There's another view of it. Uh, but again, this is kind of a remarkable survivor. And there is Will Waterhouse and his wife. And actually, Will Waterhouse was the second generation. His father founded the company. And one of those two girls was the final owner and operator who, who uh, sold it off in 1965. Um, but this is obviously a staged photograph. Everybody's in their Sunday finest. Um, and this is a very lovely rowboat, not like the previous one I showed you. The, there's some of the big, simple ones back there and some other um, finely built boats uh, in the background. And I'm pretty certain that what the Waterhouses did was they purchased boats from professional boat builders, more than likely from out of state. Uh, and uh, then they supplemented it with boats that they were capable of building. Another, what looks like a stage photo. And there's a bunch of these photos. So Will Waterhouse was at, at intervals, you know, hiring a professional photographer to come and take portraits. Uh, this is just a fraction of, of the beautiful boat photos that, that exist. And you'd put them during what time? Late 1800s, early 1900s? Yeah, early, around the turn of the century, early 1900s, yeah, yep. So is there a collection of those photos at the museum? Yes, the Sheldon Museum, yes, has those in their archives, yeah. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine who works in the dairy industry told me that he, on a um, dairy farm down in Panton, he found a barn full of boats. And was I interested in seeing them? So I was. And I went down and found this. There's half a dozen boats in this barn. This is the Hatch Farm in Panton. And these, um, these are muskrat trapping boats. And there was a long tradition of primarily dairy farmers because that whole lower Champ that Champlain Valley around Dead Creek, Panton, Addison, and so on, Bridport, um, that's all dairy land, or all, was all dairy land and that was great muskrat habitat. And as it turned out, and this, in fact, there's a box with several hundred muskrat traps in it. Um, so these were all built by Gerald Hatch, and he passed away in 1975. And he and his sons and his grandson, uh, seasonally, fall and spring, would actually, uh, Mr. Hatch would actually hire milkers so he and his sons could trap muskrats. In other words, they made more money trapping muskrats than milking cows. <laughs> okay. And uh, I gave this talk in Addison once, and an elderly man came up to me, and he said, he told me where his family farm was, and I knew the farmhouse up in Addison, and he said, I have a letter from the 1890s. He said, my grandfather was writing to a relative, and he said that he quoted what the dairy farm made that year in milk and what it made in muskrat pelts, and it made more money in muskrats. So this was a amazing subculture. And this is, these are two of my Middlebury College students, and that's a dugout canoe. 
And the man who not only owns that dugout canoe actually used that to trap muskrats. So within living memory, early 1960s, and he was, he grew up on a dairy farm down in Bridport, and the family would trap with this single log dugout canoe. And my Middlebury students, we set them up to measure the hull. Um, the entire outside of the hull is wrapped in tin. That's because a, a trapping boat has to be an icebreaker. So the couple giveaways, if you find a trapping boat is, there'll be no oar locks because you're working in cattails. So you can't row, so you pull. So there'll be no oar locks and there'll be at least around the water line, a band of roofing tin to break through the ice. Yeah. And so at Middlebury College, we built a replica of the hatch trapping boat uh, with, in, in a, in a uh, um, independent study I did with a couple of students. In addition to doing oral history research, we launched it on the Otter Creek, right in downtown Middlebury. Um, in thinking about trapping, I, I uh, did some more research, and this boat is in Cabot, Vermont, but it comes from Lake Memphremagog. And it's interesting because it's strip built. There's the wide band of sheet metal. It's made of little strips that are all nailed to the strips below. But what's really curious, it's, it's got these grown, grown natural crook frames and then no rub rail or in whale, which is actually guidebook construction. So um, a really interesting hybrid. Did the, was the builder of this aware of guideboats and imitated that construction? Um, it's amazing, because I mean, at first glance, it looks like a dugout canoe. But that was a trapping boat from Lake Memphremagog. Um, I did, uh, I, I was co co-taught a class at Middlebury College, a winter term class, and I led students in boat-related research. The class was called Vermont Waters, and I teamed up with an English professor, and he, he discussed literature and poetry about the lake and about water and about nature, and I worked with students um, interviewing boat builders, boat users, and the like. And this man's pretty interesting. He told me he's one of only two Vermonters still active building these. Uh, he builds plywood hydroplanes and he still races them. And he now has to travel like from here to Michigan to find competitions. But at one time, this was, that's Lake Bombazine. And at one time, you know, really in the 1950s, this is a post-World War II uh, phenomenon. This, I like to call this maritime NASCAR. <laughs> you know, and, and it's really what it was. I mean, Joe Kent, this, this man Joe Kent, is actually, his business is, is tuning and repairing outboard motors. So he's really a motor guy. So what he likes to do is get that outboard motor and make it run at 20,000 RPM or whatever it takes. But he can build these um, plywood hydroplanes. That's his boat, 13A there. Um, and then he goes and races them. Um, this is really dying off, but this was a big deal. And I, in fact, some of the el more elderly uh, folks I interviewed on around this subject told me that there were, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, um, there were weekly races in Port Henry, New York, of speed, or before the war, speedboats, after the war, these kind of hydroplanes. So this, this was once a big deal that, again, has kind of vanished. Uh, back to Middlebury College and my, my J-term class, where we built a pair of skiffs, traditional skiffs. This was a copy. We, we brought historic boats into the classroom. The students measured the boats and then built replicas of them. This was a skiff that came from Panton. That's the boat on the left, and that's a trapping boat. That's a hatch trapping boat on the right. And because it's winter term, you see what the weather's like outside. Um, we had to launch them in the swimming pool. <laughs> so, um, a few years later, I started a similar program at Hannaford Career Center, which is my, connect, it's right next to Middlebury High School. It's our vocational technical school. I guess you're not supposed to say that, you're supposed to say Career Center. So, um, 
I uh, teamed up with the um, engineering and architecture teacher, and I would bring, year after year, I would bring a historic trapping boat into the classroom, and first we would set it up, and the students would measure it. So it's on a table, it's all leveled, you see all the, the, the squares the students are using, they define stations, think back to that drawing I showed you at the outset, and um, then we, with coaching from, uh, uh, this is Greg Sharrow, who sadly has since passed away, he's from the Vermont Folklife Center, he would teach the students oral interviewing techniques, and then we would bring in someone connected to the trapping boats. This is John Campbell. His father built trapping boats and he and his father trapped together on the Dead Creek. And we would do an oral interview, which would then be archived with the Folklife Center. Then, um, I'll just digress here. This was an extraordinary trapping boat. It had a camouflage paint job inside and out. That's inside the boat. Whoever built, this is a really nicely built boat. I, as simple as it was, it, it had some really, really nice touches. Uh, but that was, uh, that, that really impressed me. Um, and then in the classroom, we would build replicas. So lines taking, drawings, and um, then building boats. Coming off the molds. And the people who built these trapping boats were not professional boat builders. You know, they were dairy farmers and others. They would just use a single mold in the middle to define the shape and then just bend their two side planks around. The side planks would invariably be just a single piece of pine. I'll back up and see if you get a sense of, mm -hmm. right? They're squeezing that and they would connect a stem a hardwood timber that the, with a rabbit in it that the two planks would lie in. And several of the farmers that we interviewed told us that stem rabbit was beyond them. And they would hire a local carpenter. If you have a table saw, it's really easy to make that. Set the angle, cut the, cut the rabbit, and you have it. And more than one, more than one trapper told us when I went to a carpenter or a woodworker to get my stems made. They're only about 18 inches long. I'd have him make me a 12 foot one. And as I built boats, I would just keep cutting off what I needed. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they didn't use like just rabbit planes to do it? Right? No, no, I mean, it would, they were hardwood. So well, that would be a lot of work. Well, it is, but you make a rabbit plane. I used to do that all the time. Yeah, well, with a table saw, you make it, that would be a quick. It'd be easy with that. Quick, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was more of a traditional, I guess, right? Yeah. And uh, so the boat's coming off. You see they're cross planked on the bottom. Um, the, just the pine boards go straight across the bottom. And then this is an example of they would, the students would go to their computers and do CAD drawings. Mm. And so. We were able to document about a dozen historic boat types. And this, this from a significant, the kind of thing that excites me, this is the first thorough documentation of Lake Champlain small boats. So my high school students, yeah, my high school students. And I would say that to them and they would just yawn. But <laughs> to me, it means a lot. So another view of some of our boats and we would launch them. The, the Otter Creek flows right, right behind the school. What did you finish those with? What did you see? We, uh, we, they were caulked, cotton caulking, uh, the seams on the outside, and then just paint, just oil-based paint. Uh, most of the trapping boats, you saw trapping boats are either green or gray. The oddball one is that one that with, the, with the amazing camouflage uh, uh, paint job. Um, and on the inside, we typically oil them, just a linseed oil, turpentine mixture. But the historic ones we found were just painted inside and out. So you did a lot of gray deck paint. I think gray deck paint <laughs> was the default boat paint for trapping boats. So they didn't realize, they didn't rely on any expansion on that. So it's funny, you, okay, it's funny you bring that up. Um, we heard two interesting stories. So caulking a boat, that's a fairly skilled 
thing to do. I mean, that you've got to know what you're doing to properly caulk a boat, run cotton caulking in the seams and get it just right. So it was actually John Campbell, that man you saw being interviewed, he told us his father, when they put the bottom planks on, they would space them out with a 10 penny nail. Fasten them, no caulking. Throw the boat in the water, the pine would swell tight, it wouldn't leak. Wow. Okay? Wow. But that boat, that boat needed to stay in the right. water, right? It couldn't come out and dry out. And other boat builders, you know, kind of challenged themselves and they butted the planking, put a caulking bevel, drove cotton caulking in, filled it with putty, and work that way. Um, and that's fine too. Those boats actually didn't need to soak up. They were pretty much ready to go and they could come out of the water at the end of the day, right? John Campbell told a story of somebody who they knew who also built a boat and he butted his planks and threw it in water and soaked up and all his planks bowed off the boat. The <laughs> swelling, he didn't give a, leave a space. And so they swelled and buckled. And John said, we watched him sink. <laughs> we were out trapping together. We watched him go down. His boat just swung. And after it sank, I bet they said, well, we could have told you that. Yeah. So, but I mean, that was just such a great, you know, a 10 penny nail. Yeah. Just discovering that and knowing that and remembering that. That's all you need to do. 10 penny nail, it'll work. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was also real interesting for me to talk to these men. Uh, it was it was mostly men um, about their memories because they were not they were they did not work in a boat building tradition they were not boat builders and they had their own nomenclature and so these boats are universally known as two pointers and, and finally in an interview I looked at it was Patrick Hatch and I looked at him and I said have you ever heard of the term double ender <laughs> which is the standard word we use for a boat that's pointed on both ends. And he looked at me and he said, never heard that. So they, they literally had their, their own nomenclature. I had another, in another interview, I had a former trapper um, uh, say to me, you have to spring it just right. When you build your trapping boat, you have to spring it just right. And I finally had to stop him and say, what are you talking about? And he said, the curve of the bottom has to be just right. And I said, you mean the rocker? And he said, what's that? <laughs> you know, so anyway, you know, that's, yeah. So uh, the, the sum total of about six years of work with the high school students was this publication we did. And actually it was nice. Uh, another, one of the other programs at Hannaford is, um, is graphic design. And so the graphic design class designed and published the book for us. So that's uh, that that's part of that project. Quick question. Yeah. Excuse me. Did did any of these old timers mention um, the, the way, if there was a sawmill nearby where they were the source for the wood that they were using? You know, they were buying lumber lumber yard wood. Uh -huh. All their all the trapping boats are three quarter inch planking. Uh -huh. Just a they're four typically fourteen inches wide. So they were getting like a a. Well, maybe there was a standard 14 inch wide board in those days. That's not true today. You'd get a one by 12 and then you'd get a one by 16 or something. Well, that doesn't exist either. But, but everything was just three quarter inch lumber yard planking. You know, yeah, very, very simple, straightforward stuff. Um, I don't know if anybody's aware or familiar with this business. This is at the very, very, very end of North Avenue in Burlington. Yeah. The Hour Family Boat House. And uh, that's Christine Hour. Um, she and her brother Charlie. Charlie passed away a few years ago. Christine has got to be well in her 90s by now. Um, but their parents during the Depression started this business. And in starting, just like you've heard elsewhere tonight, they, they developed a livery service. And they could wrench a fishing rod, an eel spear, whatever you needed to get out on the lake. But they, they built their own fleet of livery boats. And Christine had <laughs> one boat. One boat. That's all she had. The two side planks 
still connected at one end, no longer connected at the other. And I was asked to do a program at UVM, a boat building class, and I badly wanted to document the Our Family Boats. And Christine showed me this and I was just completely crestfallen because I thought, how on earth do we build, how on earth do we get an accurate replica from this? And so I was talking to Christine and sort of bemoaning this and she said, well, what's, what, what do you need? And I said, well, I don't know how wide this boat is. So there's no way I can, you know, I can put the, the back end together, but I don't know how wide the boat is. And she said, wait, she went upstairs and she came back down with the original builder's mold. <laughs> oh, God. And then the other thing she said that surprised me, because I kept referencing her father. So your father, built, and she finally stopped me and she said, my mother built the boats. <laughs> oh, wow. Ooh. Dad had a factory job. And mom was home with the kids, and mom put the boats together. And dad would help after work and on weekends. But she said, my mother, and then she said, my mother built this boat for me when I was six years old. And she was 86 at the time, so this boat was 80 years old. So we brought this into the classroom at UVM, and you'll see, you'll see a mold. We, I, I didn't dare take the original mold. I, I took the measurements we made. A, plywood copy of the mold and I left that original with Christine uh, but these are, this was a really uh, and we so the original we kept with us as a reference throughout the process but these had two planks per side and um, that's one of my favorite photos um, and you see the plywood mold in the middle that was the single mold that defined the shape of the boat see the hardwood stem and Again, cross-planking the bottom. Uh, uh, they built those, the hours built those boats. Uh, it was so funny. You drive a, a common galvanized nail in, and where it comes through, you bend it over. So the whole interior of the boat was full of these bent, <laughs> bent over nails, which actually, there were plenty of boat builders in Maine who did the same thing. Um, and uh, that boat held together for 80 years. Uh, nice little detail, they would put that strip over the seam between the two planks. And there's, we, we looked at carefully um, at the original boat and determined those were the colors. Nice. Yeah, they nice. weren't quite UVM colors, <laughs> but they were the colors. And um, you see, unlike the previous trapping boats, this had frame, because there were two planks, so you needed to be able to hold them together. So this had frames. And that's where the nails are driven through and bent over, clenched. And then um, that class uh, also produced CAD drawings of that boat. And we then um, took it, that's Charlie Hour, on the Winooski River, at the mouth of the Winooski River, uh, with the class, and he was out rowing it. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty much wrapped up here, and I, then I can transition from this and hopefully I can show four shots of that you sent me Corinne um, really the story I think of most of the boats on Lake Champlain is really a story of owner built boats and I in my opinion because in my research I found so few these are very beautiful obviously professionally built boats and I found almost nothing like this and I think, and, and by the late 1800s, early 1900s, as you know, Lake Champlain sort of boomed in terms of a tourist uh, culture and a summer culture, um, there were so many boat shops in Boston, you know, Canton, New York, the Thousand Island region, and so on, that I think that the, the vast majority of these boats, and maybe all of them, were probably imported from out of state. That's, that's my contention. There were professional boat builders. There were a couple in Burlington. And there were a couple in Whitehall, Whitehall, New York. But, uh, and then there were, some, uh, there were some professional boat builders in Willingsboro. There was a boat building family, Essex, New York. Hayes was in, Dennis Hayes was in uh, Westport. <clears throat> but um, surpri really surprisingly few professional boat builders, people actually hanging their shingle out saying that's what they did for a living. 
for a body of water this big. So I think um, really these boats were coming from out of the region. Uh, and I will go to that, that is my last image, and I will go quit again. And these are the boats from the Corinne's research. And again, you know, the first thing I noticed was the simple flat-sided, flat-bottom skiff here. And a, a more, I, I wouldn't say that transom is particularly beautiful, um, but it definitely a more complex boat, round-hulled boat there. And as I kind of, and I obviously invite you to look at the, the display that Corinne set up, you, as you look at the images on Berlin Pond, you see this mix of what I would say are probably boats brought from away and boats built, built locally. Not to say people, you know, didn't have those skills here, but I don't know that we had an economy that could necessarily support a full-time professional boat builder, you know. And again, that's a very simple boat back there. That's a very simple boat. I think that too. And this is a more a round hull, a little, a little fancier. Um, the first picture that you showed is from the Williamstown Historical Society, and they actually used that photo cropped a little bit on one of their history books because they wanted a romantic picture, and it was Williamstown people at Berlin Pond. <laughs> right, it was a club, right, from Williamstown, yeah. yeah. Um, this is another image. The heartbreak that Berlin Pond isn't like this anymore. Yeah, really. Well, you can now take out um, canoes and kayaks again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is pretty interesting because, you know, you look at the profile of some of the boats, that one, that one, and that one, and that one all seem the same. So that sort of speaks to a single builder and that one back there. Um, but then way off in the background, I mean, that just sort of looks like a scow type boat, really simple boat. So, yeah, it's a it's curious. Um, I'd say that boat is the same style as these. See the way the bow sweeps up. Yeah, that's that's the last image I've got there. So, so um, thank you for listening. And uh, Corinne actually has that video to show. Should I take some questions? Well, yeah, I thought I'd turn on. The and you take some questions, and then I'll put in that video. That's great. Are you going to use your computer? If I can. Just hand it to you for yours. Okay. Uh oh. Yes. So, what kind of speed would those sail ferries attain compared to like a steam ferry? Oh, they would. They wouldn't uh, keep pace with a steam ferry. I'm trying to think from my sailing in a brisk, in a brisk breeze, uh, maybe three miles an hour. <laughs> Three knots. Walking speed. More kind of walking, rowing speed right. would be my guess, yeah. yeah. you got to wait until there's some wind. Yeah. you got to have wind. Actually, there's kind of some interesting things. Ferry operators had to petition the legislature for a ferry license. And for some reason, there, there were over a dozen sail ferry crossings on Lake Champlain, and almost all of them were run by Vermonters. For some reason, New Yorkers just didn't get that. But as part of a petition, you, you had to guarantee hours of operation. You had to offer you know, regular service. And there was actually a target area. And if you sailing across for any reason missed the target area, you had to refund your passengers. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was in the... Wow. the um, that was in the, the uh, documents that ferries, ferry owners, operators had to agree to. Were they significantly slower if they're laden or, or about the same speed? Probably about the same speed. Yeah, probably so they, about the same speed. Were they fairly flat bottom? That it, Absolutely so flat. So they were pretty beamy, even up to 20. Yeah, my, the sail ferry I built, the hull was 35 feet long and 14 feet wide. So they would stay stable if you got They were waves. very stable. Waves are. They, they were would, very stable. 
Yeah. And then the ramps on the boat I built, uh, it was 50 feet overall. The ramps were about seven feet, seven and a half feet each. So it was 50 feet overall, 14 feet wide. Yeah. You didn't carry it. You a car could. Uh, I would. I would have. Nobody probably would have risked their antique automobile. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fantasy of mine. But no, that was, we did not do that. Probably the Coast Guard would not have enjoyed that. We were actually rated by the Coast Guard to carry 24 passengers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you just briefly mentioned horse ferries, and so where yeah. did they fit into? So the horse ferry has a very short lifespan, and a horse ferry, just so people know, there was actually sort of two horses facing in opposite directions on either side of the hull, on either side of the deck, in typically in little houses, little stables, and they walked on a giant turntable that was under the deck. Wow. They walked in opposite directions and turned the turntable, which spun a gear, which turned paddle wheels. Wow. So there's a famous horse ferry, very intact horse ferry wreck at the bottom of Burlington Harbor. Wow. And that's been thoroughly documented by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum and there's a couple others. But horse ferries did not last very long. Um, the first, you know, Essex Charlotte, that's, a, that's over a two mile crossing. That was originally a sail ferry. Briefly a horse ferry. And then I think went back to a sail ferry. And I should point out that uh, I mentioned the lower part of the lake, which is quite narrow. Sail ferries operated, looking at the broad lake, sail fer so going north from Crown Point, Arnold Bay, Westport, Arnold Bay, Barbers Point. Briefly, a sail ferry operated out of Kingsland Bay over to, um, I can never remember the name, there's a little harbor over there and that did not run for very long and I sailed my own boat out of Kingsland Bay and that was too up, I'm sure that was too far upwind and that only operated a few years. Then Charlotte, Essex, that's perfect across. It may be over two miles but I sailed my replica from the Chimney Point Marina over to Port Henry and didn't lose any, that's two over, well over two miles, two and a half miles didn't lose any distance sideways. Didn't have to recut it. Did not at all. Went <laughs> right across. It was great. It was really impressive, actually, because um, there was nobody alive who'd ever sailed one of these things. Um, so Charlotte Essex was a sail ferry. Then the final sail ferry I know of was up in the islands. And it's where the current, that current ferry runs to the north of Plattsburgh. So that's Isle Lamont. I, right? Isle Lamont to north of Platte. Grand Isle. Grand Isle. Sorry. That was originally a sail ferry. So, so they operated in some pretty open. Charlotte Essex would have been the longest passage. Yeah. So those lee boards really kept you from side slipping. Yes, out. the lee boards, and they were quite effective. Yeah. That's amazing that you wouldn't if you go that distance without. Yep. Right? So yeah. You have to run a flat bottom boat. And a yeah. Douglas, could you tell us a little bit more about the books you've published? Are they about boat building itself? Are any yeah. of them old photos that you've... Yeah, no, so all my books about my work in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I have, uh, I have five published books, uh, two are in Japanese only, uh, two are Japanese and English, one's in, only, in English only. So yeah, that's, yeah, my work in Japan has been, I, I've been doing that since 1990. Do you think wow. there'll end up being a book about, about small boat history? About small boat history? Um, there could be. Uh, <laughs> as, as people, people, people like to ask me, what's the hardest thing about Japanese boat building? And my answer has become raising the money. You know, so yeah, in brief, I've, I've had nine I've done nine apprenticeships with boat builders in Japan. All my teachers were in their 70s and 80s. Wow. And I'm the sole apprentice for seven of my teachers. Wow. So, so my work in Japan I see is quite crucial because that whole craft is about to disappear. Wow. And, and, and the other problem that complicated that issue in Japan is the craftspeople never wrote anything down. Everything was secret. So they leave almost no documentation. Unlike the West, I mean, my first trip to Japan, I was just shocked to discover, uh, you know, I have a 
bookshelf full of Western boat building books. But that essentially doesn't exist in Japan. If, you know, the, it's all, pardon me? I was going to say, think about how central uh, Japanese boats are to, to the Japan. Japan, yes. Japan Japanese art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah the Jap it's so interesting because the Japanese are not known as explorers. You know, they didn't sail, they didn't necessarily sail over the horizon, but, I mean, talk about a complete maritime culture, you know, because that whole coastline and the dependence on fish and everything else. What, what size boats are these you were? So my, the boats I built in Japan, uh, gee, we could segue into another lecture here. <laughs> uh, the, the boats I built in Japan are all, almost all fishing boats, and they range, you know, they, they, they go up to about 30 feet in length. So the, the, actually the biggest one was my, uh, in 2017 I apprenticed with one of the last builders of cormorant fishing boats, where you fish with birds, mm -hmm. okay? That was a 42 foot boat, four feet wide. Wow. Just the long, wow. skinny, long, skinny. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, a boat, and a boat that's been unchanged for hundreds of years. Wow. Because cormorant fishing became this sort of, now it's just done for tourists but it became this really celebrated, uh, romanticized style of fishing. Um, an emperor like 300 years ago watched it and wrote a poem. And ever since, the Japanese have been obsessed with the, the beauty and the romance. Of, mm -hmm. It's done at night. It's a very colorful very thing. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, yes, let's. So I would love to have you guys see this. Lynn Monty, who um, videoed it, she said it was okay to share, even with it being on Orca, and you can see the articles she did at the back of the room. Okay. It lasts about two minutes. Okay. You might have more questions after seeing that. <laughs> and I don't remember if I sent you any of the stuff on muskrats that I found. I didn't find really stuff connected to Berlin Pond, but it's great when you're working with somebody who's interested in the whole state. <laughs> but there's a lot more information in, in the binders that I have over there. And if you don't have time tonight, book a time with me to come up to the historical society. Oh, and sound. Where I live. The thing about steamboats is they're quite forgiving, you know. They'll slow down, and, but they'll keep going. <laughs> So I'll, I'll share a couple, just a couple of my steamboat connections. Um, the major one is, and by the way, my card is here. Feel free to take my card, go to my website, you can 
can email me from that. Um, but in Vergennes, below the falls there, that's the last cataract on Otter Creek. It's, it's about eight miles clear sailing out the lake. But the big steamboats like the Ticonderoga that ran up and down the lake, they couldn't navigate the, the Otter Creek. But in Vergennes, there was the Daniels Steamboat Line. And the Daniel Steamboat Line had, uh, they over the years had four boats, and they were up to about 40, they're all steamboats, and they were up to about 45 feet long. And Mr. Daniels was the captain, and he passed away, and everybody assumed his wife, Philomena, would have to sell the steamboat company. Well, Philomena was, I guess, a force to be reckoned with. And she went out and got her license, and it was the world's first woman licensed steamboat captain. And I live in her house. <laughs> I live in her house. She remarried and moved into the house that I live in. Her husband was a blacksmith. The, next, the second husband was a blacksmith. And historic photos are really f hysterical because Philomena was famous in the Victorian era she would be, you can see her in the wheelhouse, and she wore these, she wore full dresses and these enormous hats. <laughs> and you can see it, any of the pictures. And she was a very successful Virgin businesswoman. There's a famous story, the Daniels family, her, her descendants still live in the area. There's a famous story that, um, that one time she was walking up Main Street, you know, this literal captain of industry in Little Virgins, and um, one of her sons was, you know, barefoot and filthy and whatever, ran by and said, hi, mom. And she, Philomena was with somebody and said, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> that's, that's a story. That's a story the family tells. So that was a, that's a really successful story. And then her daughter became the world's second uh, licensed uh, female steamboat. Really, that, really that, interesting. Running that steam Yeah, that. running that business. Wow. Yeah, they so ran that, that business. That ran from Virgins down to the ran, That ran to the end to Fort Castle. Okay. And the big steamboats had regular stops as they went up the lake. And Fort Castle was one of them. So if you were a businessman or anybody in Virginia, you could commute to Burlington on the steamboat. You could take the Daniels line. Down. And they also ran over to Westport and they did excursions and stuff like that. But you could take the small boat down to Fort Casson, get off, be scheduled, and wait for the Ticonderoga to come up. Yeah, Lois McClure, I uh, actually worked on the restoration of the Ticonderoga at Shelburne Museum. It was my first job when I moved to Vermont in 1997. And the McClure family funded that three and a half million dollar restoration. And Lois McClure said, my my father would, my, wait, her, yeah, her father would get, the, in the summer, they'd be at their camp on uh, Thompson's Point, and she said, my father would get on the Ticonderoga to go to work in Burlington, and one of the summer servants would hand over a basket of laundry. And the, the, the laundromat, the laundry would pick up the, the Mr. McClure would go to, uh, uh, whatever her maiden name was, would go to uh, his job, but the cleaners would pick up the laundry and have that on the afternoon boat going back. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, steamboat days. Okay, well, any other questions? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yeah. Thank you, Orca. It'll be wonderful to share this with others. Take your time and look around. Have some snacks in the back. Make sure to get a root beer, too. <laughs>